It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. It is Jason Cohen. He is the founder and CTO of WP Engine. WP Engine is uh, a sponsor of the event today. Uh, they were a sponsor the first year, too, so they've been early supporters from early on, and we really appreciate that. WP Engine now employs over 400 employees. Uh, they've grown incredibly fast and um, are you know, one of the premier managed hosting providers in the space. Jason, this is his uh, fourth, WP Engine is actually his fourth startup, so this is uh, something that he knows and understands well, and uh, he, uh, just as a personal note, uh, his entire uh, WP Engine team is in Austin this week, and he still made time to come here after we had to reschedule, and really appreciate him uh, making the time to do that when I'm, I'm sure in the middle of a crazy week. So uh, I'm going to turn the time over to Jason. Let's welcome him to the stage. All right, last talk. You got that burger in you? That's still probably with you? It's with me still. I probably should have gotten a salad, but I've got my Britney mic on, so I'm ready to go. This is going to be great. Let's see. Oh, good. We have a thing. All right. <clears throat> All right. We're going to talk about, for the next 45 minutes, how to build a bootstrapped cash machine in the WordPress space. Because probably everyone here is either wanting to make a product that does that, or you're doing consulting, which means you really want to make a product so you can stop consulting, right? <laughs> so that's what we're doing. <clears throat> and I mean this, a, a bootstrap cash machine, a product cash machine, not uh, the Silicon Valley type of thing where you want to change the world like Gandhi. Because by the way, did you know Gandhi didn't say that? He didn't think that you could change the world either. He said, you should just change and hope the world follows. He actually never said this. Not true. So never mind. We're not trying to change the world. This is why we're doing startups, because you don't work well with others, right? <laughs> You're that person. That's why, because <laughs> that's you, right? Your ideas are better than everyone else, so the world needs you and your product. Yeah, sure, right? <laughs> no, it's because you are for, you kind of, your DNA is forced to, and also maybe you'd like to make money, like approximately a million dollars, for example. This is from a drug bust, so maybe you want to make money and maybe in a way slightly more legal than that. Although, there's only two industries which call their customers users. <laughs> right? Uh, I don't know if that means anything. Okay, so anyway, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this. Um, I'm going to assume that this is your goal to make money and, and control your own life, or at least kind of try to have some semblance of control over your life. Um, and therefore ask this question. Now, you may be thinking, uh, hey, WP Engine is not bootstrapped. We've raised $43 million, so why am I up here talking to you about it? And you might also be thinking, oh, good, another slightly overweight, cisgendered white male is going to stand on a stage and tell me what to do. This is great. Okay, so I have to give you some street cred to sort of justify my existence here. So what you may not have known is uh, my second company was called IT Watchdogs. We made server room climate monitoring. Got too hot, we paid you because it's that old. And uh, that was bootstrapped, and we grew it to millions in revenue and sold that company. And then I did Smart Bear, which is how I get my online moniker of a Smart Bear. And uh, this was also bootstrapped, and uh, it took seven years total, and um, <clears throat> also got to millions in revenue. In fact, a million a year in profit, and then was sold as well. So then WP Engine, I, I just considered myself a bootstrapper, so WP Engine was bootstrapped also for the first two years. And then for a variety of reasons, which is, I guess would be a whole other talk, I decided to have a different journey this time. So we did raise money and it changed. Um, nevertheless, obviously, this is for, for now seven years old actually doing WP Engine is how I have insight into the WordPress world, obviously. And then, um, and then another thing you probably don't know is there's this, uh, a, a, this group in, in Austin called Capital Factory. It's the biggest co-working space. It has 44,000 square feet. And it's full of companies. Some are bootstrapped. Some have raised money. There's a whole variety of stuff there. And I helped start that in 2009. And because of that, I've been either an advisor or a mentor or an investor or whatever in over 100 startups. And it is from that experience that I want to give you sort of my one biggest th reason why I think small businesses fail. Because it's not usually because your product idea is just totally bad. Because there's probably some reason why you had the idea in the first place. That's probably not it. And it's not that you're not passionate or don't work hard. Because everybody does that too. So that's not why. So what I find is that People tend to do the things that they are good at and they're comfortable with and they know rather than the things that the company needs them to do for the company to be successful. So for example, as an engineer, I say, 
I hear a customer asking for a feature. I know I can do that feature in three days, and I can turn around and ship it, and that person will be happy. And it is a good feature, there's no doubt about it. So that's what I want to, so that's what I do. It doesn't occur to me to think, are my prices too low? Because almost for sure, if you could raise your prices, that would tra tra change the business way more than the one feature that took three days. Almost for sure. Or as a designer, you think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to optimize the onboarding experience before we scale. Because in your mind, scale means five customers a day, right? Um, instead of saying, we just need to double the number of people coming to the website at all, which is probably what would actually change the company and so on. So <clears throat> I'm not going to talk at all about the stuff on this side, which you already know how to do and like, because that's sort of the problem that you know it and like. And I'm going to just talk about this stuff, how to get more revenue, um, and how to manage yourself. Because see, the problem is you're that, you're that a-hole, and, so, and, there's, and there's no boss. So you have to manage you, which is hard, because you're difficult to manage. But managing yourself and your time and your, and your mental state is actually really important. And so I want to talk about that too. So let's start with revenue, money. Okay, so I'm going to give you um, a slightly controversial idea about thinking about revenue and money and small companies, which is to think about making your business predictable. And the reason this is controversial is that predictability is normally a word you hear about large companies on Wall Street. They need to call their earnings estimate and hit it. That kind of predictability is for big companies. And so it's weird to say that a little company with just you and no customer should become predictable. That's odd. This is an unpredictable thing, right? But I actually think this is a great lens to think about how to build um, a, a, re a reliable business because your business will not succeed and take off until you are devoting 100% of your time on it. No extra contracts, no day job, no distractions like that. Uh, all of your time focused on it and a little bit of extra money, even if it's just $500 a month, that you can put back into it. Unt until that moment, it's not a going concern. And that moment to me is about $10,000 a month per founder. That's about what that amounts to. So to me, the reason predictability is, is important is if you don't know how much revenue you're going to get next month, you can't quit your day job. You still need it in case this doesn't work. Or you still need to pick up that contract. The only way to say no to that contract and feel okay about it is if you know you're set for the next six months. But that's predictability. That's what predictability is, to know that. So that's why I think that's important. So if, if you accept for at least the... the uh, the next 40 minutes, that predictability is, is, an, is an interesting lens to use. So what makes revenue predictable? Obviously, recurring revenue. You knew I was going to say that at some point. Um, so that's kind of boring. Um, so let's talk about how to justify recurring revenue, because we all know we want it, but we don't do it. Themes are, and plugins generally are one time and we're done or whatever, and it, and it sucks. So here's how to think about how to justify charging every single month. The main thing is that the value that your product is creating has to itself recur. The problem with the theme is you buy the theme and then six months from now there's no additional value that the theme is creating. That's why it's hard to charge again. Why should I pay? It's not doing anything else, right? So where's the value recurring? So for example, there are natural cycles in business um, where, the pr where your product, if your product um, is aligned with these cycles, will have to do, like finance cycles, compliance, human beings, all this stuff. You have to do things monthly or weekly or quarterly or whatever. And so the value, if your product is in one of these fields, like an invoicing software, for example, um, then it, it's natural that, that uh, you have to pay for it again. Another one is if the costs behind your product are also recurring. So this is the case in hosting. This is why all hosting companies get to charge recurring revenue, because... However you host your site, you're going to pay somebody every month because at minimum it costs power and the internet and you've got to rent some floor space somewhere in a data center or whatever or pay Amazon or pay uh, you know, one of the sponsors here, right? Somehow it's going to cost money. So the only, there's, there's no question that hosting is going to cost money every month. The only question is how much is it going to cost and what do I get? But not whether it makes sense because the costs naturally recur. Here's a whole bunch of other areas in which costs re recur automatically. And the third one, and this is probably the best if you're making a plugin in WordPress, is when the environment or the problem that your product is solving is dynamic, meaning changes in time. So like SEO changes all the time. Google's always changing their mind, and then there's Bing, and I don't know, all kinds of stuff, and it's, it's, it's confusing, and it changes all the time. So I constantly have to go back to my SEO tool to tweak things or change things because that's the nature of SEO. It's, it doesn't stay still. Um, I've listed a whole bunch of things here where that's true. Pretty much anything in digital marketing is dynamic. 
which is good because WordPress is always involved somehow in digital marketing, so it's a kind of a natural intersection for a WordPress company. So counterexamples would be things like events. Some people have events plugins, and they'll tell you. Like event, it's hard to sell things to people doing events. They do it once a year, they're stingy, like it's, a, it's bad. Or uh, uh, something like weddings, that only happens once or twice in a lifetime, right? Um, <laughs> that's bad, you have to catch someone at a very particular time, like that's a, that's a bad thing. Okay, another one that's really powerful about being predictable is charging annually instead of monthly. I don't know if this is obvious or not, but if it is obvious, not enough people do it, so I don't think it's obvious. So if someone gives you money up front, it's predictable in the sense that it's in your bank account right now. That's very predictable. That's the best kind of predictability, right? And so that's good, but it's more than good. It transforms your business, and I want to show you why, why how important it is. Suppose <clears throat> that you figure out with the right set of ads and so on, you can spend $300 on average and get one $50 a month sign up, which is not an unusual ratio for someone to get. So that means if you could spend $60,000, which you can't, but over time you can, then you can get up to this $10,000 a month uh, place, which I'm sort of put, put a stake in the ground as a good place, right? So it costs 60 k to get to that sort of place where you have a real company. So now let's suppose you do what we do at WP Engine and what a lot of companies do, which is, hey, sign up for a whole year, pay us up front, and get two months free. So now what happens? Supposing everyone does that, which they won't, but just for the sake of argument. So now if you spent $60,000, you would get $100,000, because it's not times 12, it's times 10, right? So you get $100,000 today, all of it today. And so that means you have $40,000 today. That means you can quit your job right now. <laughs> Annual changes it completely so that suddenly the business is viable immediately. All because the money's here now because that's more predictable. And it's better because a lot of advertising like uh, Google ads and, and uh, Twitter ads and, and uh, uh, Facebook ads and all these things are on a credit card. Credit cards you don't pay till next month. So that means you can run up a $60,000 AdWords bill this month. In cash, you don't pay for that until next month, right? But the customers that sign up, you do get that cash now. So now you have all the cash now. There's no cash flow problem at all. Then next month, you'll pay the 60. So that means your budget is infinite. It means that you're limited not by cash, but instead by can you find enough people? Because of course, no, that's, that is also hard, <laughs> right? right? It's, it's, you can't find that many people in one month. It's actually inventory problem of is there enough channels and ways for me to do that because that's also really hard. That's a fundamentally hard problem that you can't just fix. But cash flow you can with annual and it transforms how fast you can grow your business for a bootstrap company. So annual is, so of course not everyone will pick annual. So okay, so what if 10% pick it, 20%? It still totally changes the business. So do annuals. So the next thing, and you knew this was coming too, right? Everybody that talks to anybody always says charge more, always. So charge more, and specifically, I think you should charge between fifty and five hundred dollars. And his is the reason, because at a dollar a month, uh, you would need ten thousand customers in order to get to this level, and that's just too much. And you don't, and you have so little income that it's hard to uh, pay for it. And at the high end, you're not able to deliver the kind of service that something like ten thousand dollars a month demands. Not yet, not yet, not not early, right? So you need something in this middle ground. And what people normally do is they choose this ten to twenty dollar a month range. Right? There's a ton of products in WordPress that are in that range. And that's wrong because you need like a thousand customers. And that sounds easy. It's like, well, WordPress is 27% of the internet. And so like, I don't need that many. And $10 is so little. So the, my, my market is everyone who uses WordPress. And so this is not going to be too hard. And it does not work that way. And for example, where's Brian Krogsgaard? He's around here. There he is. So like Brian is way more well-known than you are. He knows everyone. Everyone owes him a favor. And so when he's launching his post status you know, thing, like of course everyone jumped in and joined it and all that kind of stuff, right? He's got all those advantages that you don't have. And yet, it's been two years, and according to his own 2016 report, it has 850 customers. So two years in, it still doesn't have 1,000 customers. And that's Brian. And he, he's better at this than you. He knows more people. He's, he can't do it either. And it took WP Engine into our third year before we had 1,000 customers. And Flywheel and Pagely. And I don't know about you guys, but anyway, it typically, okay, so more or less, it takes time to get to 1,000 customers at any price. So don't make that price $10. Because that's, that's just too long to get the business going. All right. 
So everyone says charge more, that's fine. So I want to spend a lot of time actually on how to charge more. because That is the question. It's not whether to, but, but how to. So I want to spend a good chunk of time on this. How to do it. So first story. So at Capital Factories, there's this company called Storm Pulse. And they do, they do this neat thing where they take weather data, which is more or less free, by the way, and they connect it with, um, with enterprise um, uh, supply chain software. So in other words, oh, there's a storm out here, so your shipments of whatever might be delayed. And so you, there's all these downstream effects that a big company has to deal with. And so they plug in some of this weather data so that people can make these, these decisions. It's pretty, pretty crazy, right? So I said, great, what do you charge for that? And he goes, $300. I'm like, that is not enough. I mean, a big company that has shipments from coming everywhere, like they'll pay way more than $300 a month to know that. And he says, no, $300 a year. Right? So I said, okay, well, I got an idea. How many signups do you get a week? And he says, like four or five. I said, okay, just for fun, go to your website and your, and your, um, and your uh, 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 billing system and change it to $300 a, a month. Just change it. <laughs> just keep everything the same. Just say per month for one week. Worst case, you don't get any signups. Just see. So a week goes by, and of course, he still gets five signups. <laughs> Next week, he gets four signups. Okay, so he comes back, and, he's, and he's, he's happy, of course. And I said, great, what are you going to do? He's like, oh, my God, there's this event we were going to go to. Now we can afford it, and there's this advertising we're going to do, and da-da-da-da. I said, that's great. What else? I don't know. He's like, I don't know. It's going to be great. Maybe we'll hire. And I'm like, you're going to raise your prices again, <laughs> right? What did you You just 12 x your prices, and nothing happened. <laughs> Obviously, what you do next is more of that until something happens, <laughs> right? So... Um, so the point is not that you can necessarily 12 extra price right out of the gate, right? Um, but you can raise prices and see what happens. You can do this, um, and, and you should. Okay, next story from us. Uh, we have a bunch of customer data, as you can imagine, and we wanted to enhance that with additional data that you can get from APIs about stuff so we can segment and do all kinds of, who cares? So we have these API companies that we're, going to, uh, that we're paying um, in order to make our data um, have more stuff in it. Pretty boring. So we propose this to our, uh, uh, our, our CFO and say, hey, we want to start spending money. It's going to cost all this to, to kind of get our data up to scratch, and then it's going to cost $350 a month to stay up to, up to date as we add customers and, and, and still use this data source. And she goes, oh, I thought you were going to say $3,000 a month, and I was going to say yes. And, the, and, the, and, and although it sounds like the Storm Pulse story, the real lesson is when you are generating real value for a company, and we're not a big company, we're a medium-sized company. Um, and so when you're generating real value, it's just way, way, way more than you think it is when you're pricing at $20. In fact, at, at a, any substantial company, maybe 100 people or more, anybody that's going to buy something, if you're not in their top three most important things they got to get done, then you're not on the list. Like, if you're number t t 10, it doesn't matter what the price is. You're not on the project list. You've got to be in their top three things that are important to them. And this is critical because you can ask your customers this and find out what are the top three things that are important to your customer list because that's what you need to hit on. In this case, for the data team, this was in the top three. And so the price was, was immaterial compared to the value. If this thing didn't generate even $300 or $3,000 of value a month, we wouldn't do the project at all. Not even if the data were free, we still wouldn't do it, you see? So if you're generating value at all, which is, of course, your job to seek that, then you can charge for it. All right, next one is uh, another one from IT Watchdogs, something that we ended up calling the magic number. <clears throat> so IT Watchdogs, again, we did server room climate monitoring, which meant we made hardware, actually, a bootstrapped hardware company. That is a dumb idea. <laughs> so, but we did it, and so... Um, anyway, so we had these devices that were rack mounted and you could plug all kinds of stuff into it with all these sensors for uh, power and the doors are open and it's hum humid and all kinds of stuff, which was cool. But this, these are pictures from our catalog. This is an actual customer installation. So you can see how meticulous our customers were. <laughs> so, but there it is. There's Airflow 18. Is that good? Who knows? Okay, so <laughs> what's 18? Anyway. So uh, so we were, we, were, we were in a closet, like literally a closet like this. Um, and we're talking to our customer, and this guy was doing something really odd. He would buy, one month he would buy $450 worth of stuff, and the next month $480, and the next month $470. And we're like, why don't you just give us five grand and get all the crap you need and be done? What are you doing? And he said, ugh. And he 
and he, and he pulls out his credit. You can imagine what this guy looks like if this is his workspace, right? So he, he drags out this, this, uh, this credit card, and he goes, see this card? This is my company card. If I, char- if I buy less than $500 from a vendor in a month, I don't have to ask permission. But if it's five hundred and one dollars, I gotta go through all this paperwork and stuff and approvals and blah blah blah. I'm not gonna do that. Aha! There was a magic number of five hundred dollars a month for this guy, where at four ninety nine for whatever the product is, it's free for him. Free. He doesn't care. At five hundred and one dollars, it's like a million dollars. <laughs> like this better change his life, or he's not doing it. It's like this weird cliff, and it has nothing to do with how much value does the product generate. What does it cost us to make hardware? Uh, no, none of those normal market forces. It's just how does he buy? How does he buy? What's his mechanism? And what, and what incentives does that create? How do they buy? And it turned out a lot of IT guys had this range of like four to $500 was magic numbers. Because once we heard this, we started asking. <laughs> this is what you do is you ask. How do you buy stuff? Is there an approval process? Is there a floor? When do you use a credit card? Like ask. And then you discover, in our case, there's this number. And so we made sure that you could buy a base unit and like two or three sensors for less than $500, period. Like whenever we had new sensors and stuff or new base units, we always made sure you could make something like that knowing that's how they buy. Okay, so how they buy, that can be just as important. Magic number. Okay. I was just talking about adding value. That's sort of a generic statement. We add value, great. Um, but a lot of times we talk about saving money. Like, like the, the typical thing that you read is, we take care of the, mm, so you can go back to, mm, mm, right? Which is sort of like the save money, save time, like, because we really want to do this, which is, please don't say that. Like, nobody, nobody thinks, oh, good, I get to go back to doing that thing. That's not what anybody thinks ever. So let's suppose you have a product that makes advertising more efficient. That sounds good. It's great. So how could you sell it? Well, let's suppose you want to sell it with a before-after sort of thing. That's common, right? It works. Yeah, it's, it's great. Okay, so we're going to use this technique, before, after. So it makes marketing more efficient. So one way we could sell this is the saves money version. The saves money version is, you spend $40,000 on those Google ads every month. And with our tool, because it's more efficient, you only spend 20. Boom, save 20 grand a month. And that is good. There's undeniably good. It's, I want that product. The other way is just to say, you know, you get 200 leads a month from AdWords. With our product, same marketing spend, you can get 400 leads, more value instead of less money. Now, which one does a marketer want? Well, think about the marketer going to the CEO and saying, hey, I figured out how to save 20 grand, but I have to buy this tool. CEO's going to go, great. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But, but what the marketer's job is is not to save money. It's to create leads. That's what's valuable. And if the marketer says, I'm going to create double the leads, even if it costs us more, the CEO goes, hell yeah, you're going to do that. <laughs> right? That's the value. And in particular, let's think about it in terms of what you can charge, because this really makes it clear. So what can you charge for the, for the save 20 grand? Well, not 20 grand, because then they haven't saved 20 grand. It has to be some smaller amount. So maybe five grand. So like, hey, we're going to save you this, we'll charge you a, a piece of that. So five grand. So that doesn't sound so bad, right? But the very fact that you've said, I'm going to save you 20 grand, caps what you can charge right off the bat. On the other hand, what can you charge for this? Well, today they spend $40,000 to get 200 leads, right? What will they spend to get another 200 leads? $40,000 every time. If you told me we could just, if you just double your spend, you get double leads, we would do that in a nanosecond. So one is worth way more than the other. Same product, but you sell the value that you generate, not the cost or the time that you save. So you can go back to, no. So you can be a hero to your CEO because you just killed your job. That's what, right? Okay, add value, not saving money. Uh, the last one I'm going to show you on this particular point it, uh, is a lot of times we see big companies with weird products and we say they're dumb, right? We like to say that about Microsoft. Maybe not now. They're starting to get smart again. But for like 15 years, we said Microsoft is dumb. Microsoft, by the way, generates $60 million in cash profit per day. So that's pretty stupid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, so here's QuickBooks. Talk about bad UI. I mean, if you're a designer, you're, you're like, this is bringing tears to your eyes, right? Like, oh, I can't see it. I mean, look, there's like lines going everywhere. There's, look up here, like at the little, whatever that is, the numbers are all cut off. And look at that scroll bar, you can't even move it. I don't even know what that is. 
Like this, it, it, look, look at the menu bar's wrapping. What the hell's a wrapping menu bar? I don't even know what that means. It's just so bad, <laughs> so bad, right? But Intuit makes billions of dollars a year, and they've been doing it for decades, which is a long time for a tech company. So they're not dumb, even though this UI is horrific. So what explains that? And the answer is up there at the top where it says QuickBooks Accountant. Because the way QuickBooks works is they go to the accountants and give them software so they can do all the work and charge you a lot. And then the accountants tell their customers, you have to use QuickBooks because that's what plugs into my systems. And that's why everybody uses QuickBooks, because they went through the accountants. So what this proves is that business model beats UX, right? And so rather than saying, oh, they're dumb because their UI sucks, even though their UI, of course, does suck, rather than saying they're dumb, you have to think, wow, if they can be that bad and they can be that successful, they must be doing something really smart. So I need to figure out what that is, because maybe there's a lesson like selling through accountants, or in our case in WordPress, it's selling through agencies. If I can get 100 agencies to do something, and collectively they make, say, 100 sites a month on average, that could be 100 new customers a month for me by getting 100 agencies on board. That's the, in, that's the Intuit model. And it can be smart if you don't say they are stupid and, in fact, figure out why they're smart and maybe use it. And so just to drive this home, can Theme double its price? Because themes are like the worst, right? Um, but if, and so, like in 2011, Elegant Themes uh, faced this and decided to try it. And like this article was written about them, saying you cannot just raise prices from 35 to 75 dollars overnight without crippling the marketplace. Very, very stern. Very sure. Of course, they double prices and nothing happened. It was fine, and so they're doing very well. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, of course you can just do it. So none of this like oh, it's WordPress. I can't possibly charge. Well, why don't you try it? Maybe you can because other people in WordPress who have tried it have, in fact, been successful. All right. So that's a lot about pricing. Let's turn to your asshole self now. Because <laughs> there isn't any way. It's actually it's hard not to have a manager, actually. No one can tell you what to do. Sounds great. But actually, everybody sort of needs a foil or advice or direction or validation or something. Like, it's actually kind of hard just to be alone and by yourself, which is what it is. And so, um, so I want to give you a few tools. This, this again, this could be a whole conference, just this, right? But I want to give you a few tools that I like for dealing with um, sort of the, the personal aspects because, again, a lot of times people stop is just because it's too hard or just because they're spending their time in the wrong places and so the business doesn't develop. So I want to give you a few of these. So let's start with time. I know a lot of people in WordPress, you do too, that... Um, they launch a product, and it's not bad. You look at it, and you're like, that's kind of cool. And then you see them in a year, and the product's better because they've been working on it, and they don't have that many customers and still not a business. We all know these folks, right? Maybe you're one of those folks, right? Um, so that means you didn't use your time well because if the product's better and people aren't paying for it, then, then that's not a business. It's a hobby, which is fine. Hobbies are cool. But if you want it to be a business, then that's not it. So... <clears throat> Again, this goes back to sort of the, uh, the original observation that as, as engineers, we want to make stuff, and as uh, designers, we want to design and, 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 and build stuff in that way. And it's usually the wrong thing. And I want to give you an example to sort of drive this home and ask this question, how important is design for just as an example? Design's hard, that's for sure. Um, and we're all, you know, everyone in this room is pretty good at it, but it is hard. So um, remember IT watchdogs with the with the, the, uh, the server room, so here's, here's the website. <laughs> look, look at that calliope colored menu bar. Who even knows what that, what, what that means? Look, at, look, broken images on the homepage. Like the product, the product demo image is a broken link. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> right? This is like, this company made millions of dollars a year, guys. <laughs> okay? <laughs> with broken images. Of course, you see our customers are pigs, too, so like, you know, maybe that's why, maybe they don't care. It's like, oh, one of them, just like me, a mess, <laughs> great. No, I don't, no, but, but it, it didn't matter, which is weird, right? Um, even WP Engine, this is our first, first website. Um, look, I'm my, own, my, my own testimonial, that was cool. You guys know Balsamic Mockups? That was one of our first customers, that was kind of fun. We were, we were big time then. Um, anyway, this was this is kind of uh, a juvenile, but not too bad. Until you scroll to the bottom and saw that there were MySQL errors <laughs> shooting out of the footer. This is real, <laughs> man. The hosting company can't get their act together. No database selected. What are you talking about? Anyway, <laughs> right? 
but it's okay. Like, we still got customers somehow. I guess they don't scroll. I don't know. But, but, here's, why, but here's why I'm telling you a story, because this is now data. I mean, now I'm going to give you d data. This is funny, data. So then we got a new website. And, and is it better? I don't know. There's pictures of us. There's the whole team. And it's a 60-day free trial. That's pretty smart, I guess. And look, a testimonial from someone that's not us. So that's good. Um, looks better. So did it work? Let's go to the data. Did our new design work? So let's look at bounce rate. This is by week. Can you tell what week uh, we changed the new design because it inflected the bounce rate? No. All right. How about time on site? How long did they stay there looking at all our stuff, trying to figure out how to buy this stupid thing? No. Conversions? Didn't change any of the data. Nothing moved. Even, even database errors shitting out the bottom and getting rid of those, they didn't matter, which is weird. Now, that's not, to say, that's not to say design is never important. I'm not trying to, you know, knock that. I'm just trying to make the point that it's not necessarily, the things that you feel are important, like design or features, are not necessarily as important as the importance you put on them. And again, that's because you know how to do it. You are excellent at it. You have a good eye for it. You want it to be good. You're a perfectionist. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why, like, that. you, you want to do that. But it's not necessarily going to help the business. Things like revenue and distribution, all this kind of stuff, that will. So what, can, what should you focus on? What is a good driving question? There's, you could pick what you want. I'll give you one that I like, which is how, to, how can I double my business? Why double? Because if you've gotten from zero to this so far, it stands to reason you can do it again and probably in less time. It just stands to reason. It's not going to take massive invention in order to figure out how to do that. So you can probably do that. But 2xing the business is substantial. It's material. So I like 2x is kind of like it's enough and it's doable for sure. But it's not, you know, 100x or some kind of crazy thing. You can probably uh, do it. And the answer is almost never, if I add this one feature, my business will double. That's almost never it. Or if I just redesign my homepage. It could be, and if it is, then do it. For example, I could have a big customer uh, who will sign on for real, because they always say that and then they don't sign up. But there could be a big customer that really will sign up. Maybe they sign the purchase order um, if you make this one feature and it really will double the company. Then do it. That's good. We had those uh, now and then at WP Engine and we did them. And early on that was okay. That helped us get going. Um, so. Uh, but it's probably not. It's probably one of these other things that you're not wanting to do, but you need to do. Okay. So time is one thing. Your, you know, your crazy monkey mind's another. There's this, there's this well-known quote by Musk, who's our, you know, all of our favorite, you know, inventor dudes. And so he says this about. He was asked. He was asked about Tesla. And uh, Tesla almost ran out of money, and he had all of his life savings in it. It's this whole story. And so they asked, "How do you? How did you feel?" And he goes. And, he, you know, he, he says, uh, well, um, it's like standing on the edge of an abyss, staring out and chewing on glass. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, that sounds great. And then, so then he was asked the same thing uh, recently, because Tesla is doing well now and all that. So, okay, now it's good, right? So they said, how does it feel now? And he goes, well, uh, I'm not standing so close to the abyss, but there's still a lot of glass chewing. <laughs> like, so we have that to look forward to. This was supposed to be fun, you guys. Like, what, why are we doing this again? I forgot. Um, so the point is, it is tough, and it does feel like that, and it's also alone. It's lonely. Um, no matter what. Like, it doesn't matter if you're bootstrapped, raise money, blah, blah, blah. It's still pretty lonely, because ultimately it's you. And that's, that's tough. So I want to give you a couple of tools now for thinking about that. Again, this could be a whole conference, but I just want to give you a couple of things. Um, <clears> the <throat> first thing is this lesson. There's no words on this lesson. But it's a, le it's a good lesson. You're the, you're the rabbit on the left, right? And the other rabbit is your competition or people that you respect online or something like that, right? And this is how we feel. And it feels bad. And it's not useful. It's not conducive to your company becoming better. It's just a bad feeling. It's not useful. Um, but everyone feels like this, everybody. You can talk to people like me or Brian or Chris Lemmer or people who talk to a lot of people in the WordPress area and they'll all, everyone goes and tells people like Brian that they feel inadequate and bad and blah, 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 blah. And Brian will say, no, man, you're, you're great. Don't worry about it. Everybody feels this way. Everybody does, which just shows that they're all wrong. And the reason this happens is because when you see someone else, you see their best augmented self. It's just like no one's that happy on Facebook. That's just what they post, right? It's the same thing with other people, anything, blog posts and doing talks like what I'm doing, right? This is just, this is, this is an augmented different person than the real person, right? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is um, 
so who, was ta- who was I talking to about worst boss ever? We were ta- I was talking to somebody about this. Yeah, worst boss ever. So what's worst boss ever like? I'm, I'm, this is going somewhere, I promise. <laughs> Think about the worst boss ever. The worst boss is, uh, is always telling you it's not good enough, even when it's really good. Right? Worst boss ever, if there's a good thing and a bad thing, worst boss only looks at the bad thing, only talks about bad thing. Even if it's 99% good and 1% bad, uh, worst boss ever talks about the bad thing. Um, and if you make a mistake once, worst boss ever never lets you forget that. If it's years later and it's not even relevant, worst boss ever still brings it up all the time, right? So you have a worst boss ever because you are your worst boss ever to you. You don't let your things go, right? If things go really well in the business and then there's this one other thing, you're the one that doesn't let that go. You are the worst boss ever for you already. And it's not helpful. It's not useful. Um, and the reason is it's part of the same egotistical perfection that made you start a company in the first place. Like starting a company is egotistical. I, the world needs me and my thing that I'm making. That's weird. But part of that is because you're critical of other things and you do see ways that it could be better or smarter or something like that, that's true. But that gun doesn't only point outwards. That gun points at you too. Your own stuff you're not happy with. Your own web page is never good enough, right? That gun is not, is not only for others. It's for you too. Now that's good in the sense that it makes you better and it makes you strive. That's good. So you keep that good part. But this other part where you can't let this other stuff go and you feel like this, like that's a, you just have to recognize, oh, that's what that is. I'm going to go ahead and let that go. I'm going to set that aside. That's not useful. I'm going to keep it for, for being better. I'm not going to keep it for this. Waste of your time. This is what it's really like. This is the truth. It's not rabbits. It's this, right? So, for example, the small company can look at the big company and think, oh, look at all those customers they have and revenue and all these employees doing all this cool stuff I can't afford or I don't have the specialty to do or blah, 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 blah. That's so cool. So that's one of them, right? Meanwhile, the big company's going, God, we move so slowly. We can't do anything. We can't change our mind. If we even change one thing in the UI, then our 60,000 customers, like if 10% of them have one question, that's 6,000 tickets in a day and we're dead. So like we can't even change one thing in our UI, right? Ah, I wish we were small. And, and they're really both wrong. <laughs> they're different. That's all. And so here's, here's a good story that um, illustrates this but also illustrates the answer or the solution to this. So, <clears throat> Bill Hader is one of the best players of Saturday Night Live ever. So, Bill Hader tells the story about how he went to audition for SNL. So, he gets in the elevator, and he's standing there, and he looks next to him, and there's a guy in the elevator holding this big box of props. And so, Bill goes to himself, oh, shit, this guy's prepared. He brought props. I got nothing. I just walk in there by myself with no stuff. Why don't I have props? Of course props. SNL is not improv where you're miming everything. SNL has props. Where I'm just going to go in there and mime like an asshole? Like, shit, I'm so unprepared. I'm not going to get this. So he goes in, and of course he, he gets it anyway. The other guy in the elevator was Andy Sandberg. Andy Sandberg, also another very successful player on SNL, and was also selected in that audition to join SNL. Now, later on, Bill... Uh, confided in Andy that, oh, you know, uh, this is how I actually felt in the elevator. It feels weird now, but that's how I felt. And Andy goes, that's really funny, because when you walked in, I went, oh, my God, this guy's so good, he doesn't need props. (laughs) Fuck, I'm dead. I'm dead. What do I got? This is like a crutch. I'm going to walk in there with a crutch. This guy doesn't, oh, my God, what am I doing? Right? Right? They're both awesome comedic talent, period, the end. They have their own stuff, that's all. They got their own stuff. It's not about that, right? It's never about that. That's why it's also the answer. So the answer is to revel in what you have and not worry about what other people have or how they feel about that. Just be the woman in the top, right? That is the solution. So as a small business, you have a lot of advantages. It doesn't feel that way because big companies have money and brand and salespeople and whatever. So it doesn't feel like, oh, they have all this stuff and I don't. But you have a lot of things. You can move very quickly. You can do whatever you want, and you don't have to worry about the consequences of that. You can change your mind. That's very powerful to be able to do something and then say no. I mean, look at, look at any big company. They all had different logos at the beginning, everyone. 
Uber had this bizarre Uber cab. It was this really weird, awkward thing. I should have included that screenshot too. It's ugly, terrible. Who cares? Nobody cares because when you're small, you don't have a brand. They just change it. It's cool. Um, you, you can have really personal customer interactions, which is rich and powerful and generates advocates. And it's kind of fun to have a close relationship with customers. Um, another thing you get is forgiveness. So for example, in the early days, when we had problems with uptime or something, people would go, hey, I know it's just you guys, just a couple of you guys, it's cool. I'm, I'm with you because I'm rooting for you. Not now. <laughs> Not now. If anything happens, like, oh, these guys, you know, they, uh, they have all those servers and mine went down. I don't know, whatever, right? Like, we don't get any of that. But then new competitors come up and they, you can see they get it. Oh, they have problems. That's okay. They're just three guys. I'm like, yeah. I know that story, but just wait. <laughs> They're going to turn on you. <laughs> it's going away. But you get, that, you get that early, which is great. It's a fantastic thing that, that a big company can't have no matter how, what, what their brand is or how much money they raise or all that garbage. It doesn't matter. You still get it. You have advantages that you can use against any competitor. It's, it's awesome. So the thing is to, is to work that out. And then since we're all engineers, we need flowcharts. So I'll give you flowchart. Okay? All right. So... Then what? Because the Buddha teaches us that all things come into being and they change and they die. All these things will die. I, I sometimes say, I don't, this is probably a bad thing to say, but I tell people at WP Engine, you know, everyone here is going to either leave or die one day. <laughs> Which, <laughs> it's true, but maybe not a great, <laughs> great thing to bring up. But it's true, and it's useful actually uh, to, to think of that sometimes because what it does is make you realize as a company, what you can do, what you need to do is think about what are, what are we doing for employees? What will it be that where they do leave or hopefully not die, that they look back on that time as well worth it? That they grew and it was for something and I don't know, good things. They were treated right, it was fun, more or less. Um, so so it's, it actually is kind of a good, uh, good way to think. But in the, in the context of a bootstrap company, here's what happens. It is so hard at the beginning, all we're doing is trying to not die, right? A, a little startup is like an infant just constantly trying to kill itself, <laughs> right? And so, because you can't get the customers, like it's just, uh, it takes all your time just to get a sign up and get, you know, and, and, and just don't cancel because then it'll go back to single digit number of customers, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you, when people ask like, what's your goals? What's your five year plan? Where do you want to be? And it's just like, I don't know what I'm going to have for lunch today. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to not die. That's what I'm, that's my plan, right? And that's, that is true. That's fine. You don't need a freaking five year plan when, when you're that little. It's true. But what happens is, because you're not thinking about it, by the time there is something substantial and material, you have something, and it's not clear whether that thing is something you want and you want to be at. And this, again, happens a lot more often than people like to say, because it's sort of like someone having kids, and you know, a lot of people, after they have kids, they realize that was a mistake. I don't really like kids, but it's too late. And, but they'll never be able to say it. You're not allowed to say that. But some people think that, right? And more people think that than will ever say it. The well, same thing is true with startup. Now, some people have enough stones to say it. And you've heard people in the WordPress community talk about this, right? And there's, there's, there's uh, uh, whether it was what, what uh, Daniel was going through with WPCLI and kind of having an existential crisis about, like, what is this? What should this be? And what is my role in this? What do I want to do? And that's tough because from the outside, you look in and go, but he's w he is WPCLI. He's got fame. He's running this incredible project. Everyone loves him. What's the problem? Right? Or, um, or what Corey Miller talks about a lot, as, as he's very open about, about feelings about iThemes, now that it's, what, eight, nine years old? Um, so this is, again, more common than people usually let on. We have a few people brave enough to let it on in the WordPress community, but this is true. So this happened to me at SmartBear. And it's a lesson I took away so that it wouldn't happen at WP Engine. So I want to tell you so that you can see kind of what that looks like right and wrong. So what happened at, <coughs> at, uh, at SmartBear was, um, so it was about six, six years in, and uh, we're doing great. Again, we were doing about a million a year in cash profit. So this, not, you know, in Bootstrap, there's like 12 of us. It's great. So I got an offer to sell the company, and the offer was good. Like just financially, it was like, oh, that's, you know, it's not like you know, some crazy valuation, but like it's good. So I went home and, and told my wife, like, I just got this offer to buy SmartBurst. I don't know what to do. And she says, well, you have to sell. I said, well, I mean, I don't know if I have to. She goes, oh, you have to. I said, why? She goes, don't you, want, don't you know how unhappy you are? No, I didn't. Frog boiling water, right? I was snippy all the time, 
angry, not sleeping, blah, 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 all kinds of stuff. But who, who can tell? And who, who will tell me? Right? Because I'm the big boss man. Who's going to tell me that? Right? This is the problem with not having a boss, right? Is that you, you have to be it. So I didn't know that. So I did sell it. <clears throat> and, and that was healthy to do. But why did that happen? Why did I get burned out at my own startup? I mean, isn't the whole... I put six years... And by the time I left, seven years of my life into there. I gave you my best years, you know? <laughs> and uh, how did it end that way? Because it wasn't the plan. I had that same, like, we'll figure it out. Right, but then it, it landed somewhere not healthy. And part of the point of entrepreneurship is to build the life that you want. And it doesn't matter if that's huge, raise money, horse shit, or if it's bootstrapping, or if it's, I never want to hire anyone, I just want to make as much money as possible without hiring someone. It doesn't matter what your goal is. The point is to build whatever you want it to be. That's the idea. And I somehow didn't build that because I wasn't conscientious of that, and I wasn't thinking about that, and I didn't value that. And early on, okay, you don't have the time, fine. But once you do, then it's important that you figure out, what, but what do I actually like? What do I actually, what is actually fulfilling? What gives me energy instead of takes it away? The, and thus will, will be interesting and, and good instead of something burnt out. Or am I just the person who needs to get, uh, to change jobs every three to six years? And, and just that's going to be it. That's who I am. That could be possible. But figuring out what that is and building for that, that's required or else you'll land not unlikely in this situation because you get into a, a startup with these ideas. Here's what it's about. Here's what it's, um, here's the purpose of it. Here's what it'll be like. And at first it's hard and then it kind of is that way that you think it is. But again, nothing is static. Then it changes again. How do you know that thing it's changing to is something that you'll like unless you're working on it on purpose? <clears throat> so at WP Engine, I did do this on purpose and I did it right. Um, and that's part of why I'm not the CEO right now. Because what a CEO is, as the company grows, turns into something that uh, I don't like. It's, whether I'm good at it or not is not even relevant. I get burned out. The answer is some of it I'm good at and some I'm not. The company deserves to have the best people in every position. And I deserve to, have a, to do something I like. So this intersection of what does the company need, what are, what are you good at, and what do you like, there's usually an intersection of that. And that's where you need to keep yourself by being introspective of how things feel. Um, so at WP Engine, now it's, we're in our seventh year, and I feel great because I was intentional this time. It wasn't by accident this time. So um, there's this guy, Thales. He was a Greek businessman, and you know the Greeks invented everything. We just have to figure that out, right? And so he was asked, what's the hardest thing? And he said, to know thyself, which is what I'm telling you. <laughs> you ultimately need to do in this entrepreneurial enterprise because you know, say it's not business, it's personal, or it's not personal, it's business or whatever. It is. It's personal and business. It's what it is, period, right? And so know thyself. That's the key. But it's the hardest thing. And then he was asked, what's the easiest thing? And he says, to give advice. <laughs> <laughs> so here I've been giving you, a, doing the easiest thing for 45 minutes, telling you to do the hardest thing. But it is the truth. That's, that is the, that's the solution. So I hope some of this was helpful. Focus honestly on what's going to double the business and work on those things, even if it's not the things you want to, so you can build a real business. And then once the business gets going, really think about um, what are you building so that you don't just build something that, uh, that you end up having to run away from. And trust yourself and don't worry about what's happening to the left and right of you. It's okay. This is yours. Build your thing. Thank you. <laughs>